that God has been blessing you and enriching your life as I know he can and he does. Uh, our prayer list as we get started, remember uh, Katrina Hall, Urban Thomas, uh, Carolyn Bush's nephew, keep him in prayer. Uh, he's not doing well and so uh, pray for his, his, his family, his wife, children, uh, everyone in there that's looking after him and praying for him. So keep Calvin Bush's nephew uh, in your prayers. Also keep the Miles family in your prayers because on this coming Saturday they'll be memorializing uh, Brother Ronnie Miles uh, in Newington, Georgia. So keep them in prayer. Keep Shalid Green in prayer. My sister who uh, uh, has contracted this virus from uh, one of her co-workers, also Jaquel Hall, my niece, who is sick with and tried and steadily improving but getting over this virus. Uh, Kawisi Garvin, Brother Garvin, who helps us out on Sunday mornings, keep him in prayer. He has the quarantine. Uh, let me be clear, he does not have the virus. Someone on the job tested positive for the virus, so, they, so those uh, around in the area had to quarantine. So he does not have the virus. I need to be, make that clear. He's simply quarantining to be safe, to be sure, um, because of a co-worker on his job who tested positive. Also, uh, Sister Jenkins, uh, soon to be granddaughter-in-law, she tested positive for this virus. So, um, Jayla Williams, keep her in prayer. She tested positive uh, for the virus. And then Gwen Bryant, keep Gwen Bryant in your prayers. She had a terrible fall and broke uh, one of the bones in her right leg. So um, keep her in prayer. That is pretty painful. You've got to have a serious fall to, to break a, a bone in one of your legs. So keep her in prayer. That's Sister Gwen Bryant. You keep all of our church family members in your prayers that God will heal them and for those of us who are, are doing well pray that God will continue to protect us and keep us safe and sound now come with me to Luke again Luke chapter 12 and let's let's uh, launch from there Luke chapter 12 it's interesting how the word of God works we started with this peace offering and we've looked at fellowship and we've looked at how God desires to have peaceful relationships with his people. But notice how it has launched us into another uh, look of study. And that is, um, we've now been touching on Jesus coming again, the second coming again. But it launched from the fact that the, uh, the, the host of a wedding party became upset because he found some servants, or he found one, in one passage in Matthew 22, he found a guest that he had invited who was clothed properly. Then we see in Luke 12, we see what happens when children of God are unprepared for the groom to come back again. So now let's look at what we've, let's, let's revisit what we've already talked about in the Luke 12 passage. And of course, for those just coming on, we too, we started in Luke 12, verse 35. But notice, they were they. We see a lesson of being prepared, preparedness, keeping the lamps replenished or fully oiled, staying alert, staying awake. Um, they anticipated the master's return, um, and they filled in the void of the master not being there by active service. And remember, uh, we talked, we, we made the point that Christians, number one, we anticipate the Lord's coming, but then secondly, we do not want to be a people who when the Lord comes again, he finds us inactive. He finds us not doing what God has called us to do. And then, Jesus flips the, flips the coin and he shows how rich this fellowship and this relationship we have with Jesus is. He says when the, 
when the bride, well, when the groom comes and he finds his servants active and serving, guess what takes place? The master switches places and he then serves. Which tells me, church, there isn't a Christian alive who serves God faithfully who will not be blessed and whose needs will not be met by the master. You know why? Because active service, participation in kingdom business, doing what God has called you to do, do you know what it does? It pleases the master. Let's read it again so, because sometimes we forget and we read over things and we don't really take to heart what's being said. Now notice, let's look at verse 35 again. Be dressed in readiness, keep your lamps lit, be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so they may immediately open the door to him when he comes back and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master, watch this, will find on the alert when he comes Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Why? Because he is so moved by the active service and diligence and faithfulness of his servants that he now makes sure he meets their needs. Listen, you cannot lose obeying God. You cannot lose serving God. You cannot lose um, uh, with what God has called us to do simply because God is moved by faithful Christians. I'm not just talking about Christians who come to service on Sunday morning or Christians who come to Bible midweek Bible class. I'm not talking about Christians who quote a bunch of Bible scriptures. I'm talking about Christians who are active in service. Watch this. So active that they, are, they lose sight of who's watching them. They are active and without any accolades involved. They are active not seeking pats on the back, not seeking to be shown of men what they do. They are doing what they are so engulfed in, in kingdom activity that God is moved to meet whatever need that they have. Which means if you really, if you really want to get to the, uh, the heart of the matter, if you really want your finances to be blessed, then give yourself to God. If you really want your family to be blessed, if you want your marriage to be blessed, if you want your personal relationship, you want, you want things to go right on your job, then what you are, are striving after, if you just give back to God you and active service, he will make sure and guarantee that all the Christians' needs are met. That's what this, this, this text shows us. And then he shows us that we are people who are ready. We are anticipating his coming. Now remember, we talked about that on... Uh, the previous Bible study, that what motivates active service is not only God meeting our needs, but also the Christian understands Jesus is in fact coming again. So an inactive Christian or an unfaithful Christian, someone who isn't diligent about kingdom service, guess what happens? You then show that you really are concerned or you do not really believe that the groom is coming again for his bride. Look at that. Well, that brings me to another thought. And this just hit me. Imagine how tragic it would be for the groom, for the groom to come back and find an unfaithful bride. Think about that. The text wants, shows us we ought to be active, faithful, diligent. Boy, how tragic it is for the, for the groom to come and then he fools around and 
finds his wife. Or let me, let me rephrase that. Or the groom comes and finds his bride fooling around. Hmm. Isn't that something? But what Jesus wants is for us to be ready for his coming, anticipate his coming. We ought to welcome his coming. They're in, they're in the thing fearful about the second coming of Christ for the child of God. Matter of fact, that's a celebration. If you and I are alive when Jesus comes again, boy, that's, that's, that's more to reason to rejoice for the Christian. Just like death doesn't, doesn't, death doesn't uh, hurt the child of God, it actually ushers us into the presence of God. It actually puts us closer with Jesus. But the second coming does the same. For us, the second coming says to us, that we welcome the fact that our Lord is coming to take us back to heaven with him. That's what this second coming is all about. That's the blessing of the second coming. And so Jesus says, you need to be ready. Make sure you are ready. Make sure you anticipate his coming. Make sure you are looking forward to the master. Now, we look at a couple of scriptures. Let's come back again. Look at 1 Peter chapter um, 1. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 quickly. Now notice verse 13 again. Therefore prepare your minds. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13 says, Therefore prepare your minds for action. And watch the next word. Keep sober in spirit. Fix, watch this, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When is this grace to be brought to you? When Jesus comes again. What is involved in, in this grace being revealed? You as a child of God anticipating him coming again. Anticipating him revealing this grace to be revealed. Now watch this. He says, as obedient children... Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. What's the, what is Peter after? In no matter what situation a child of God finds himself in, what, he, what Peter is suggesting to us is that we be anticipatorily waiting on Jesus to come again. And that second coming is also our motivation, watch this, for active service in the kingdom. If you really believe that Jesus is coming again, nothing else would motivate you other than that to get busy for Jesus. But then he says, as an obedient child, do not be conformed. Now remember, I just told you it's a tragic thing for Jesus, the groom, to come back for his bride and find his bride unfaithful. Watch this. Peter says basically the same thing. Do not become unfaithful. He uses the word conform. But do not be conformed. Entangled again. Do not become unfaithful with the world. Now notice. He says do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who has called you, be yourselves, be holy yourself also in all your behavior. Why? Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. You, uh, if you address uh, as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Now drop over to chapter 4. Look at verse number 7. 1 Peter chapter 4. Well, let's begin at verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 1 says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. What's the point? Active kingdom service says, I refuse to be entangled with the world. I refuse to give in to the lust 
of the flesh, and now I live toward and for the will of God. As a matter of fact, it's the will of God that motivates me. But then he doesn't stop there. He says, for the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatry. What causes a Christian to escape such behavior? By being active in kingdom business. You have a hard time spending time with the devil when you are spending more time with Jesus. When you get involved with what God uh, takes as kingdom business and what God deems to be uh, Christian work and responsibility, you don't have a whole lot of time to fool around with the devil. You don't have a whole lot of time to mess around with the world. But now notice, he says in all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipation and they malign you. And they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead. That though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. Now I said all of that to get to this point. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Now, he says, get your mind right. Clear your mind. The only way you can clear your mind is by being uh, controlled by the purpose and the will of God, making sure you aren't entangled with the world again. It's the same thing that Jesus gives in the parable in Luke 12. What did Jesus say? It is a blessing. When, he, when it, it, the, the, the bridegroom comes and he finds his servants working again. They are active, not again, but they are actively working. They are actively serving so that it moves the master or the groom that he ends up serving them. Now, what's the point? When you are active and, and diligent, faithful to the Lord in service to him, guess what? He will also make sure your needs are met to carry out his purpose and service. There isn't a child of God alive who can, who can say with, without hesitation that they have been so active with God that, uh, that they have been deficient in some need to be met. You can't find a child of God who's diligent, who's working. Watch this. God will not allow his purpose to fail. So if God won't allow his purpose to fail, guess what? He's going to equip us to carry out the purpose. So you never have a lack of doing what God called you to do. The problem is we become lazy, we become lethargic, we become callous in our work, we become like Jonah, we run. Or, as I talked about, uh, what, a Sunday ago, last Sunday, we get angry with God. And then we, we choose not to do. There are some Christians who believe when the scripture says to whom much is given, much is required. There are some Christians who refuse to work for God because they are afraid that if much is given, then God is going to require much from them. Yes, he is. But that doesn't give you the, the, the idea. You should never take the idea to work less because you don't want the responsibility. As a matter of fact, God is going to hold you to those responsibilities in what you have as or what you consider as being less. There is no way around working for God. There is no way around active service for God. Whatever God has placed in your hand, he will hold you responsible to make it come to fruition. And guess what? He is going to take away all the excuses from us. You know why? Because he's going to equip us to do what he has called us to do. What a blessing for him to find us diligently serving. But let me give you another reason. Why you ought to keep sober minded. Look at first, look at first Peter chapter five. Well, let's begin in verse number five. First Peter five, verse five. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. 
For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He's opposed to the proud, but gives grace to those that are, I told you God equips you with what you need. Then, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. Watch this. Cast all your cares or all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Now, here's why you ought to be humble enough to cast all your cares upon the Lord so that God can give you the grace and equip you with what you need. Here's verse 8. Be sober. There's the word again. Be sober. Be on alert. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, he is saying the devil is a lion. He's using a metaphor to, to show that how, how dangerous Satan is and how he can wreak havoc on the Christian's life and mind if you do not remain alert, if you do not remain sober-minded, if you do not engulf yourself in kingdom business. He says, be careful. And then it takes humility for you to actually humble yourselves under God. Sometimes the problem with us as Christians, uh, what causes in an inactivity with Christians, what causes lethargic attitudes towards Christianity or towards the kingdom, is a lot of times we aren't humble. And sometimes we get too high for God. Sometimes we think we are as high as God. And God cannot work through us effectively because you and I will not bring ourselves low to submit to the authority of God. And then we get out there and we get ourselves caught up in all of Satan's traps. You know why? Because we've allowed ourselves to be blinded where you can't see. You are inactive and that inactivity has blinded you enough so that you um, you do not see when Satan is at work. And it causes you to think that what's out there is better than what God has for you in his kingdom. So he says, be alert, be sober-minded. Now let's, let's put this to, let's, let's close this, come back to Luke 12 again. Luke 12, he says, blessed are those, verse 37, are those slaves whom the master will find on alert, and when he comes, truly I say to you, uh, that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. And whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third watch and finds them, so blessed are those slaves. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known of what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Now he gives the analogy of a homeowner, uh, and he says this homeowner was unprepared. And because of that, his house was broken into. Then he says in verse 40, you too be ready. Look at what he says to his disciples. Be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So, the second coming of Jesus will be sudden and it will be unexpected. You, you, he will come at a time that mankind and even Christians will, will be caught off guard. Those who are inactive. Diligent Christians, as I've already showed you, are actively serving and they are anticipating his coming again. It's motivation for them to serve God because they know he will come again. And they seek to please God by doing so. Um, I wanted us to get to another. Uh, well, let's close this with 1 Corinthians 4. And there's some other scriptures. Maybe we'll look at uh, Luke chapter 19 on Wednesday. We'll look at Luke chapter 19. And then we'll close out with a few other scriptures to look at, but um, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now notice, let's begin at verse number 1, and let's
let's land the plane with this one. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Now, remember, Paul then is speaking of uh, their, their calling as apostles. And he says, God has given us the stewardship of mystery, of the mysteries of God. Now, when he says the mysteries of God, that just that's another way of saying God's scheme of redemption. In other words, God's wise plan to save man. And he says, God has given us that awesome task and responsibility. And he says, Paul says, we are stewards of it. But now notice the next verse. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one, watch this, be found either faithful or trustworthy. Notice, Paul says, listen, the point is, if I'm going to serve God, if I'm going to claim to be a child of God, what's, what's required? That I, be a, that I be a faithful steward of what God has given to me. What he has placed me, placed in my hand, the gift he's given me, the responsibilities he's given me, the talents he's given me. He says, I am a steward over that. I'm not anything more than a steward who manages what God has placed in my care. And that's what Jesus is after when we look at Luke 12, when, we, when, when Peter talks about being uh, diligent, being sober-minded, being on alert. He says, because if you don't, then that devil who comes around uh, will devour you. And here's the thing to remember. You have never seen on the Animal Channel where lions always give a hint that they're about to devour their prey. Now, they make lion calls to each other, but they aren't hunting. Whenever lions and lioness begin to hunt, they never give clues that they are around. So it requires us, if, we, if Peter describes Satan that way, it, it requires us to constantly be diligent to constantly be on alert, to constantly be active. Notice, when lions set out to hunt, whenever they zero in on a prey, usually that prey is unaware, and that prey is stagnant or dormant. They may be drinking water, they may be feeding on the grass, grazing on the grass, but some way, shape, or form, that prey is not aware that those lions are around and they stop moving, which makes it easy for the, for, the, for the lion to come in and devour the prey. Well, that's the same way Satan works in our life. Inactivity, not being alert, not anticipating the Lord's coming, uh, Satan has his way with us. So I want you to be diligent in your kingdom business, be diligent in your service to the Lord, and always ask in your prayers that God will open a door for you to share the mysteries of God, the, the, the scheme of redemption, God's wise plan to save man. Listen, I've already given you the list of those on our prayer list, so I want you to join me in prayer as we pray for those uh, on our prayer list. Father God, our great God and Savior, we thank you for your blessing us. We thank you for your, your wise plan to save us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your Son, Jesus, who makes this all possible. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. And Father, we pray and ask that you will give us the tools and, and, and equip us, Father, so that we may serve you, that we may be active always, that we may be diligent and that we are found trustworthy and faithful in the kingdom. Father, we pray and ask that you will uh, strengthen and heal those on our sick list, those who are uh, asking for prayer for themselves or loved ones who aren't doing well, those who have been stricken with this virus. We ask the Heavenly Father that you will heal them with your healing hand. We ask that you will give uh, strength to those who are caring for them, and Father, that you also protect those who are caring for them, that they will not uh, be taken ill by this virus. Father, we pray and ask for those families, the Miles family, who 
will uh, bury uh, Ronnie Miles. They will memorialize him uh, on Saturday. And we pray, Father, for peace and comfort in their life while uh, as they mourn the loss of Brother Miles. We also pray, Father, for many of the, uh, the members here. We pray, Father, for those who help to uh, facilitate the worship service, that, Father, you will also protect us and keep our health uh, intact so that we may continue to serve thee and your people, Father, so that they may get the word and that they may uh, continue to have studies uh, throughout the week. Father, we just thank you for all that you're doing for us. Many times we take for granted when things get hard, how good you are to us. But Father, we want to say thank you for just being an awesome God in our life. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the church. Thank you for uh, the redemption that we have through him. Father, we just give you all the honor and praise. It's in his name we pray. Amen.